lecture will focus on the piano music by Francis Poulenc, its interpretation, and more specifically on the possibility to enhance this interpretation with information he included in his vocal scores and his writing about them. Uh, you can follow the handout if you don't have one, you still can go out and grab one. <laughs> where I pointed the main discussion topics. I will review shortly Poulenc's biography, the major influences, the choice of instruments in his works, and then I will review shortly the cycles of nocturnes and Les Soirées de Nazaire. The next part of the lecture will be dedicated to the specific problems of interpretation present in Poulenc's piano music and the answers that could be found in his vocal repertoire. We know that art song or melody was one of the Poulenc's preferred genres. He produced over 150 melodies throughout his lifetime. Contemporary French poetry was a major source of inspiration for the composer, influencing almost all of his, uh, his output. Poulenc was also a gifted writer, leaving a priceless account of his thought and intention. In light of the undeniable importance that melody, voice, and poetry had in Poulenc's life, my presentation today will expose the interconnections between the vocal and pianistic styles in his music and will offer new insights to the interpretation of his piano works, particularly Les Soirées de Nazelle and Nocturnes. I will begin with a short survey of the most important facts of Poulenc's biography. Francis Poulenc was born on January 7th of 1899. His father, Emile Poulenc, owned a chemical industry, which was to become later the pharmaceutical giant Rome Poulenc. His mother, Jenny Royer, came from a historically Parisian family dedicated to artisanship. She also was a gifted pianist. From the age of five, Poulenc studied under the guidance of his mother. The music that he used to hear at home as a little child influenced his own musical taste. Later in life, he often expressed his love for the music of Mozart, Chopin, Schumann, and Schubert, whose works he often heard performed by his mother. By the age of 13, Poulenc's uncle Papou takes Francis to see Petrushka and the Rite of Spring. Poulenc admired Stravinsky ever since. Beginning in 1914, Poulenc studies piano with the great Spanish virtuoso Ricardo Vinius. During their weekly piano lessons, Vinius transmits to the young composer his passion for the music of Debussy, Stravinsky, and Eric Satie. He also introduces Poulenc to Manuel de Falla, Marcel Meyer, Jean Cocteau, and Eric Satie. Through a family friend, Raymond Linossier, Poulenc gets involved in the literary circles. They frequent together La Maison des Amis des Livres, a bookshop where the clients, more than just buying books, had the chance to meet the authors and engage in debates and conversations with them. Here, composer discovers poetry of Louis Aragon, Paul Eloi, Guillaume Apollinaire, and André Breton. In 1917, Poulenc is rejected in the, at the entrance exams of the Paris Conservatory for placing a dedication to Satie on the score of his Rhapsody in Elgar. This would be the only Poulenc's attempt to pursue a formal degree in music. During the years between 1918 and 1921, Stravinsky helps Poulenc to publish his first works with Chester in London. The vocal cycle Cocard on the text by Cocteau gets very good reviews. In 1920, composers Jean Jovic, Arthur Moniguer, Germain Taifer, Darius Millot, Louis Duret, and Francis Poulenc decide to form Les Six. From 1921, Poulenc takes private lessons with Charles Cochelin. This will last for four years. In the 1921, he also meets Serge Diaghile, the director of Le Ballet Russe. Five of the members of Les Six, along with Jean Cocteau, produced collectively the Ballet de Le Marie de la Tour Eiffel. Mm -hmm. In 1927, Poulenc buys his Touraine house, Le Grand Cotteau. This decision would affect his financial situation during the next decade. 
during the 30s, Poland has financial problems and it's, is forced to write pieces that sell faster, piano compositions and songs. He also meets Bariton Pierdonac, who becomes his recital partner and companion for many years to come. Poulenc meets influential patio, influential patrons, such as Princess Edmond de Polignac, who commissioned Concerto for the Piano, Marie Lo and Charles de Noailles, sponsor of Paul Masquet, and others. The death of composer's friends, poet Federico Garcia Lorca and composer Pierre Octave Ferro, affect Poulenc to such extent that he has a vision of a black virgin and embraces this new fervor of Catholic faith. From 1940s to the end of his life, Poulain produces his master works in the genre of opera, Les Mamelles de Jerusalem, Dialogue de Carmelite, and La Voix Humaine. Other important works include Violin Sonata, the incidental music to the play Les Animaux Modèles, Sinfonieta, L'Histoire de Baba, Piano Concerto, La Figure Romaine, the Flute Sonata, Gloria, <coughs> and Se Prépond de Ténèbres. He often performs abroad, receives hon honorary doctorate from Oxford in the same ceremony as Shofta College, mm -hmm. and obtains commissions from influential organizations. Poulain dies on January 30th of 1963. Poulain confessed that he loved three things above all others, music, painting, and poetry. On this slide, I list the composers, artists, and writers that influenced Poulenc the most. In the left column, you can see the composers that Poulenc often mentioned in his interviews and letters as the most important to him. In the middle column, you can see the painters he refers to in his writings, or the artists who directly collaborated with him. On the right, you see an extract of Poulenc's Bibliothèque Ideale, ideal library, which in, in fact is much longer than this list. I have chosen those authors whom Poulenc admires without reservation. The entry on the list, in this case, says everything. Besides the obvious interest in the serious music, Poulenc loved the Parisian urban culture, which he called folklore of 20th century the culture of the music halls, Café Chantant, and Operettas. Poulenc not only admired the popular singers of the cabaret tradition, he imitated their style in many works. For example, the famous improvisation Hommage à Edith Piaf, or the Vals Musette Le Chemin de l'Amour, dedicated to the cabaret singer Yvonne Printemps. Let's hear a fragment of this song performed by Yvonne Printemps. works, we can hear that cabaret-like sound image so well portrayed by Yvonne Printemps. 
I will show a couple of passages from the preempt route from the Soare de Nazaire and from the variation number two, mm -hmm. number five. chamber music setting, nine are for wind instruments of any sort, and there are only five total works for string. Fulang had difficulties with writing for string. Three attempts of a violin sonata had to be destroyed until he finally finished one late in life. The string quartet ended in a crash point too. From this account, we have, can clearly see that Fulang prefers, especially in his chamber setting, the voice and the instruments that breathe. This preference suggests that there is something inherent in Fulang's language that involves the breath as a natural means of phrasing. Not only this preference determines Fulang's choice of instruments, it also informs the form and the texture of the majority of his work. He chooses wings because they breathe in phrase like human voice. This particularity of his musical language is crucial for the understanding of this piano music too. When Poulain referred to his vocal music, he demanded from the performer a complete immersion in the poetic text, the freedom of musical instinct, and a lively imagination. He despised singers who strive to analyze his music too much, sacrificing the expression of the strings and instruments. When Poulain was asked why he, who composed everything at the piano and had such an intimate relationship with the instrument, composed most of his music for voice, he said, quote, I always ask this question to myself without being able to answer it. I can only declare that my best discovery of piano writing came to me when writing accompaniment to my songs, end quote. I believe that since the composer thought that his best piano music belongs to the song, we must refer to his vocal music to find clues that can help us interpret his piano music. The songs also offer a very poetic imagery suggested by the text. In piano music, we do not always look for this kind of imagery. However, Poulain's demands from the pianist emotions and sounds that are not abstract. I believe then this is why we still hesitate to play his piano music while the songs have been present in the voice repertoire for decades. It's time now to overview the nocturne. This table, the other table, <laughs> or this table, gives the details of the individual nocturnes. The set of eight nocturnes, as we know it today, is a result of long years of work starting in 1929 in adding the final piece in 1938. The entire set was published in 1939. Unfortunately, the English language literature on Poulain has been very critical of the, of the quality of Poulain's piano work. And the authors of those publications influenced in, in part the general opinion about Poulain's place in English history. Keith Daniel, for example, dismissed Poulain's nocturnes as, quote, uneven and not often performed today, end quote. And the period of time during which they were written as, quote, a period of Poulain's greatest pianistic failures and 
some of his least personal most superficial words and thoughts. Others seems to agree with this statement. However, I think that these pieces are filled with extraordinary experiments in piano sounds, resonance, intimate sensitivity, and subtle, witty, and fine humor. We find in this cycle a gracious portrait of a young dancer, a poetic night scene with faraway bells, a nostalgic remembrance of a sick old man, and a picturesque musical description of the chaotic flight of a moth in the sky of Parisi. There is also the enigmatic nocturne number, number six, which I would like to take a moment and discuss now. It is the least understood of Poulenc's nocturne. We find descriptions like outdoors or field of interest. Henry Hell, author of the first and approved bike of the composer monograph on Poulenc, fails to mention it at all, only stating that the setup is of uneven interest. Frank Ferrati, a French specialist on Poulenc, dedicates several passages to this nocturne to suggest association with the style of 17th and 18th century, sewing machinery, the pathos of Rachmaninoff, and Ravelian sensuality. However, all of these descriptions prove useless for the performer and interpreter of this special piece. From the first sounds, this nocturne transports us into the enigmatic oriental world. There seems to be an exotic flavor to the harmonies and scales. The ostinato fit uh, in the bass suggests the sustained sound of the Indian sitar. <laughs> Typical for Poulain, little coda, 
2013, she did not serve even a parent acceptance of her terrible fate, furiously using the harmonic colors of Chopin's funeral march.
is what is not it. Commas are used much more often than in nocturne. Planck uses them in order to separate phrases, gestures, sections, single notes, and to pinpoint the quirky character of some of the pieces. The composer creates a slight delay or hesitation before the notes that seizes our expectation of the arrival moment of the sound. Thank you. 
equality of French progeny also implies that the equal syllables on the page must adjust in length and emphasis within the frame, following the Baker and Marshall gesture. In the recording of the recital of Denis Duval and Poulain in Bordeaux in 1958, we hear Duval taking great liberties with Poulain's regularly paced melody. On this slide, we can see the original text of the song and how Denis Duval sings it. Let's hear the beginning of this song. does not always reflect the nuances of the spoken French language. Duval adjusts the length of the syllables according to the internal rhythm of each word in a sort of French language Sprechstunde. It's also important to remember how much Poulenc admired the art of chansonnier, particularly Yvonne Frontin and Marie Chevalier. Poulenc confessed once that if he could pick his destiny, he would, could, would have been Maurice Chevalier. <laughs> <laughs> On the next slide. So that's his, actually that's his phrase, of course, from Poulain. If I could chose, have chosen my, my destiny at the cradle, I would have been Maurice Chevalier. If we listen to the recordings of Chevalier, we discover this singing style that takes the same liberty with the rhythm. I chose the song that Poulenc offers as example in one of his radio broadcasts, dedicated to the delicious bad music. <laughs> Let's listen to Maurice Chevalier performing a fragment of the song Moi avec une chanson. Et can we hear the song? Is that possible? <laughs> language has to do with the occasional emphasis on the initial syllables. French language naturally accentuates the ends of the word, but when special emphasis is needed, the initial syllable of a multisyllabic word can carry an accent, which also alters the natural rhythm of the phrase. Dile, can we switch to the next slide, please? Thank you. <laughs> For instance, if we need to give importance to the verb venez, come we will need to switch the accent to vene. In Poulain's musical setting, without text, we find examples of the same shift in accentuation. The example on the next slide show fragments of where Poulain uses this principle. Can we see the next slide? Thank you. I especially like the first example from the nocturne number one because Poulenc repeats the same phrase, one after the lower, and the second time he applies the accent. <laughs> Les Soirées 
number seven is marked as say the law, but the metronome marking is the modern quarter note, 84. <laughs> The composer indicates the astonishing 16 note 66, the tempo that is so slow that the melodic line becomes unstable. <laughs> However, the recital of his Denise Duval shows us a much clearer plan. The same happens in recording his Claire Croissant, Rose de Cour, and Geneviève Turin. It's clear that Plant knew how to adapt his interpretation to different voices and temperaments. On this slide, I have examples of two different versions of Avant le Cinema, which Plant recorded with Bernard and Rose de Cour. Let's hear her Bernard's version. Et puis ce soir, on se reviendra au cinéma. Mais les artistes de Cosmos se feront, ce ne sont plus ceux qui cultivent les beaux arts, ce ne sont pas ceux qui s'occupent de l'art, la poétique ou bien musique. Les artistes, ce sont les acteurs et les actrices. Si nous étions des artistes, nous ne dirions pas le cinéma, nous dirions le ciné. between the poetic text in the song and the imagery required in order to create a convincing interpretation of Poulain's piano music. In the piano pieces, Poulain's poetic instructions such as à l'aise, play easily, lancer le trait, thrown and pulsive gestures, one thing in the distance, très là, very late, <laughs> mystérieux, mysterious, mélancolique, melancholy. Eclaton, bursting forth, creates a visual and emotional image that produces a unique blend of sound and fantasy. Even generic pieces like Nocturne include titles for verbal instructions that erase all hints of abstraction. Pianists who intend to perform Poulain's piano music must become acquainted with his musical voice and his extensive writings about his melodies. Without having in mind the vocal ideal, the pianist will not achieve the very best interpretation of Poulain's fascinating piano music. 
to illustrate the measure in which Kulak identified himself to the vocal ideal, I want to hear this fragment from the recital performance, for, from a performance with Dimitri White at the Zal Davo in Paris, where they performed the scene from the opera Le Mameli de Céline Dia. <laughs>
Thank <laughs> you. 